Hello, Terry. It's absolutely such a delight to get to see you and to talk to you about Carline. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to see you. How are you? I'm good. So happy that we get to talk about Caroline. Uh, it's 11 years old now. It feels like yesterday. You can see I'm surrounded by my memorabilia. Um, so it's never that far away from my heart. I just, I, I honestly feel like it might be one of my favorite performances I've ever done in my entire career. And I wasn't even on camera. <laughs> Well, you weren't on camera, but they, I, I remember Henry telling me that he wound up taking more and more of your performance, including that into their vision of both the mother and the other mother. Do you like them? I'm your other mother, silly. The hardest one for me to play, believe it or not, was the real mother, um, because I'm a mom and Especially when, I, when we were doing this movie, my daughter at the time was maybe 10, I guess, 10 or 11. As a mom, I definitely believe that uh, moms need to give themselves a break. Moms, you know, they, they, and parents in general, especially now, oh my gosh, um, you know, you, you've got to be easy on yourself because you know that you're doing your best and you can't be perfect at every moment. But playing that character and being sort of, impatient and at her wits end and not particularly nice or loving. That was hard for me. Try some of the chard, you need a vegetable. It looks more like slime to me. The being the sweet other mother, the sort of perfect other mother, that somehow <laughs> felt a little bit easier. Hungry, aren't you? Give me gravy. Well, here comes the gravy train. Choo, choo. <laughs> I think we've got a clip. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and it would be kind of wonderful if we could see that clip with the original mother in. Hey, Mom, where does this door go? I'm really, really busy. I think it's locked. Will you stop pestering me if I do this for you? Fine. Bricks? I don't get it. They must have closed this off when they divided up the house. You're kidding. And why is the door so small? We made a deal. Zip it. You didn't lock it. Ah! I have a feeling that like 80% of parents feel exactly like that right now. <laughs> when I did the voicing of the character, there was really nothing to look at. It's not like, um, you, you see the animation finished and then you voice it. You do the voicing first and then the animators kind of work towards you. And then maybe you go back in like a year later and change it a little bit and, you know, do what they ask you to do. And it, it kind of like begins to come together as one. I always thought this kind of animation is, is the biggest exercise in delayed gratification. You cannot be involved in a project like this if you want it to be done instantly. I mean, I think this movie took seven years, really, beginning to end. In some ways, even longer, um, because I sent, I finished writing Caroline in about 2000. And it was actually finished before American Gods was finished, but we knew it was going to be published after. Okay. So I sent it to Henry Selleck. I had my age, I didn't know Henry, but I knew that I wanted him to direct it. So I had my agent send it to him. Henry called up and said, I want to do this. Um, so Henry wrote the script in maybe 2001. He kept trying to get it made. Nobody would make it. He wound up going to a studio in uh, Portland called at the time Vinton, Will Vinton Studios. That became Leica. And all of a sudden, Leica were willing to commit to making Coraline. How did you possibly come up with this idea? 
it, it kind of began with my daughter, Holly, who is now in her mid thirties and a mother, uh, but at the time was about four years old and would come back from play school and climb onto my lap and dictate stories to me in which uh, small girls normally called Holly would come home to find their mothers had been replaced by an evil witch who would then lock them up in the cellar and they'd have to escape. And, you know, there were normally ghosts in there as well. And these things were terrifying. And mm -hmm. I remember going to my local bookshop and saying to them, what have you got in the way of really good horror for like four or five year olds? And I got a look. And I thought, oh, well, okay, I'm going to have to write this thing then because it isn't out there. Wow. Uh, so that was where it began, was just wanting to write a story that would be about fear and about doing the right thing and about being brave. When you wrote it, were there, were there any passages that you got stuck on or that you you thought oh maybe i'll go this direction or maybe i'll go this direction or was the whole story just clear to you from beginning to end oh that's such a tricky question uh -huh. um it was fairly clear uh -huh. however i wrote the first couple of chapters showed it to my editor in the UK, in the publishing house I was at, he read it. He said, it's absolutely unpublishable. And I said, why? And he said, well, it's, and this was 1991, I guess. He said, it's, um, you're writing for adults and children, and there's no way we can publish that. And it's horror for children, and that doesn't exist. Um, and I don't know how we would bring this book to market. And I very shortly after that moved to America. And this was a book that I'd been writing in my own time. And now I didn't have any of my own time left. So I stopped writing it for, I guess, about six years. Wow. And then one day I looked around and realized that I now had a daughter called Maddie who was heading for the age that Holly had been when I started writing Coraline for her. And that if I didn't actually finish it, um, then there wouldn't be a book. So I sent what I had to my current editor in America and she read it and she phoned me up and she said, what happens next? And I said, give me a contract and we will both find out. Wow. I think I'm incredibly lucky that it did work. I think I was also very lucky that the book had such a voice that when I went back to it, it was there and ready and I could just carry on. There was so much stuff that I knew from the beginning. I had the other mother in my head from the beginning. I had the door, which I stole from a door in my childhood house that had bricks behind it. I had the black button eyes and the well. Where did the cat come from? The cat came from partly the fact that we weren't allowed any pets in the house we were living in, which is which was actually the house I set Caroline in. And I missed having a cat. I really wanted a cat. And while I was sort of in the early stages of putting the story together in my head, I remember I was driving to the railway station and passed a field with a black cat in it. And it just looked like a patch of night. And I thought, you, I'm, I'm having you in my book. Oh. oh, that's so sweet. The next clip that we've got actually is probably you as the lovely other mother. Okay. You as her. And she, uh, where did you get her voice from? Because it's so sweet. She is so alluring. Working with Henry on the voices was you know, spectacular. I mean, he's an unbelievable director and artist and communicator, but surprised me from what I anticipated. Uh, I think, you know, when you go into doing animated projects, cartoons, movies, it's easy to think about doing, you know, some little squirrel voice or something really weird or high, like you're on helium or something, you know, that, <laughs> that some crazy goat, something. 
but he really wanted it to be real. He, he wanted the emotion to be real. He wanted the voice to be real. And I think when I thought about creating the, the nice other mother, I tried to just remove every sound wave of anything anxiety. Everything was just ease. Her voice is like the oral equivalent of a hug. She's <laughs> being embraced by this lovely, sweet 1950s Donna Reedness. It's magic. Which everyone also needs right now. Everyone also needs a hug right now. <laughs> Possibly not from another mother with black buttons for eyes, though. Possibly not. One Halloween a few years ago, um, I dressed up as the other mother. And then we had some people over and I made roast chicken. So you could tell I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of this movie and chicken. <laughs> <laughs> you could stay here forever if you want to. Really? Sure, we'll sing and play games and mother will cook your favorite meals. There's one tiny little thing we need to do. What's that? <laughs> well, it's a surprise. For you. Our little doll. Black is traditional. But if you'd prefer pink, or vermilion, or chartreuse. Though you might make me jealous. No way! You're not sewing buttons in my eyes! Oh, but we need a yes if you want to stay here. So sharp you won't feel a thing. Ow! Okay, we, we all want to know, inquiring minds, including mine, want to know, where did the button thing come from? Oh, I, <laughs> if, I, if I had a time machine, I wouldn't be going back and buying sort of, you know, Apple. land in Manhattan or Apple stock or whatever. I would be going back to me in about 1990 in Nutley in Sussex in England. And I would say, you know, you're gonna be writing this book called Caroline and you're gonna think of the other mother and you're gonna give her big black buttons for eyes. And would you mind noticing where you get the idea from and where it starts and why you think it's a good idea? Um, because people are gonna ask you about it for the rest of your life. I remember lots of things. I remember the door, I remember the building, I remember plotting a lot of stuff, but the idea that the other mother, that there would be something weird about her eyes seemed incredibly natural. Normally films come out and they kind of fade away. Caroline just feels like it gets bigger and more important with every year that passes. You know, friends of mine with young kids that are obsessed with the movie, they'll they'll say to me, can you leave a message on their answering machine? You know, what? Well, nobody has an answering machine anymore, but you know what I mean, on their, on their voice now, can you leave a message in the, other, in the other mother's voice? And so I do that a lot. Mostly my go-to one is I'll just say, you can stay forever if you want to. And then they're like, ah! <laughs> That was terrifying. Your daughter was in it, wasn't she? She was, um, which is such a funny little, it's the only acting thing. She, she's a writer, actually. Um, she's just graduating from college this year. Um, but she, it's the only acting thing she ever did. But it was really, it was, a, it was a very cool moment because I had asked Henry, you know, would it be fun? Is there any little thing that my daughter could do? And so he thought about it and he actually made her audition for like an hour on the phone. He had sent her a lot of different little characters and um, he settled on allowing her to be the firefly in, in Coraline's bedroom when the fireflies are flying around and, and they're going, Coraline, 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 Coraline. That's my daughter. So I think our next clip, things are going to start to get a little bit spooky. They say even the proudest spirit can be broken with love. <gasps> and of course, chocolate never hurts. 
Like what? They're cocoa beetles from Zanzibar. I want to be with my real mom and dad. I want you to let me go. Is that any way to talk to your mother? You aren't my mother. Apologize at once, Coraline. No. I'll give you to the count of three. One. Two. Three! Ow! What are you doing? Ow, that hurts! You may come out when you've learned to be a loving daughter. Wow, that is creepy. I have hurt. I got that doll right here. So amazing. Oh, look she at really that. is. She's, I mean, what, what did you have to, you, you were talking about all of the taking out all of the harshness and the anxiety when you were the first version of the other mother, the, the extra loving one. What, what were you doing for that version? I felt the, what I wasn't thinking about being scary. I was thinking about how disappointed I was and trying so hard to hang on to not showing her how disappointed I was, but obviously very much losing that battle. Like as my body just grew into this spindly, you know, scary creature. And, and, and that's why when I listen to it, like I hear these moments, which this is all from Henry's direction, by the way, for sure. But I really tried to hang on to the, the sadness that, that got very covered with explosive anger. You know, that's what you see, she's so angry. But to me, underneath that, I was so sad. She's going to die if she doesn't get the energy of this next child, you know, like she's going to cease to exist. I really felt like the project and, you know, obviously you're writing in Henry's direction and all the artists, you know, going back to being up in Portland and seeing all the sets, I went to the costume room. There was a woman knitting like 21 tiny little vests. And it's unbelievable. Like that's the kind of work that and love that people were putting into this project. And I guess I just wanted to take it really seriously to try to deliver what Henry needed to make his vision come <laughs> true. The other mother, I remember the final form she was going to take was stuff that they, it took them a while to come up with it. The, vi uh, the visual of what it would be? Yeah, there was a version that I saw that was very, um, she just sort of became monstrous. And they, Henry decided that he really wasn't comfortable going in that direction and he came up with the idea of something much more insectile. Mm. And because we have the metaphor of the spider's web running all the way through the story and the idea that this is a spider's web, that the other mother is in some ways a spider. You're wrong, Coraline. They aren't there. Now, you're going to stay here forever. No, I'm not! Ha <laughs> ha 
That's intense. That's definitely my palms are sweating. I have one more piece of um, of, of uh, memorabilia. Um, can I go get it? I'll be right back. Absolutely. Okay. It would be a very bad thing if she had disappeared off into the other world and was never seen again. Way right downstairs. We'll come back up. So I know that people didn't think <laughs> that we would be friends, but in real life, we're actually friends. <laughs> this is my cat Friday. And Friday is a glorious, incredibly Coraline cat. That final moment at the end yeah. where the cat disappears and people still come up to me to this day and go, what does that mean? Have they really left the other world? What, what's going on? And well, I'm like, I ask kind of funny. You get Coraline too. <laughs> I've promised for years that there will be a Coraline two as soon as I come up with an idea for a story that is even better than Coraline one. Oh, well, that's going to be hard to top. But I look that's forward to it. And the good news is, it doesn't matter how much I age because it's just my voice. <laughs> It is the magic. It's the Simpsons magic. You can just carry on forever. We can bring back the other mother. Actually, every now and then I meet people who are like, I saw Caroline and it traumatized me. I slept with a light on for four years. Uh, how could you do that to me? So, but most people, most yeah. people were traumatized. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's been a special presentation, a gift to you from Entertainment Weekly. I'm Neil Gaiman and I made Caroline and Terry Hatcher voiced Caroline and it's been such a delight getting to talk to you. And uh, if you haven't seen it, go check it out because uh, you won't be sorry. <laughs>